John Vest is the extension agent for Floyd County with the Virginia Cooperative Extension. His expertise helps novice and experienced farmers produce quality livestock and crops throughout our region. John has offered to share his experiences with our audience and provide them with the knowledge to keep agriculture strong. This is the Ag Show with John Vest. Welcome back neighbors and friends. As you can see, we've made our way over to the actual large garden area that we've got down here just below Stonewall. And uh, we've put the tiller uh, through the pace just one time up uh, in this piece of ground. And I think it's important for all of us to remember that when it comes to using uh, either tillage equipment or turning the ground initially with a a plow or anything of that nature. We don't ever want to turn the ground uh, right after a rain or while it's still um, relatively wet. What we end up creating is clods and slicked areas that um, really does seem to bind the soil worse or create a, a poorer soil structure uh, than having allowed a period of time to dry out. So what you're looking at here is basically a piece of ground that uh, was initially prepped a couple weeks back. It went through the rain showers and things that we had just Saturday morning, just three days ago. And out here today, uh, we decided we, uh, we have a, a pretty good appearance to the soil and what it appears to be uh, a dry enough soil to run the tiller through and not create any problems. So what we would initially look for and if I stopped back and, or stepped back and just grabbed a, a clod from the initial ground preparation is I want to look for a situation where as that soil uh, is crum crumbled in my hand, I would like to actually create the situation where that soil just literally crumbles and falls you know, right apart or falls off. I'm not trying to create a ribbon of soil or mash a, a wet piece of soil out um, what I want to see is that soil readily break apart and start to crumble uh, right there before. It's just like this soil is doing. That's a good, uh, that's a relatively good situation to be in uh, to indicate that we're prepared for some uh, ground breaking, uh, you know, uh, ground breaking equipment. Looking here, we've raised the tiller back up, but as it traveled through here, this tiller tills about four inches a little more so than that as it's making its travels across. But a good way to see whether or not I have a hardened soil or a pan below that is to actually just take a piece of rebar. And you can buy expensive tools and uh, tensionometers and various things to uh, actually uh, tell us exactly where a hard, a hard pan would be located. But if you can take a piece of rebar and understanding that, like I said, the upper four maybe six inches of tillage um, uh, should be relatively loose and, and quick with the rebar, but that the rebar itself should travel almost 12 inches deep with little more than me pushing down on it in the ground, not with any hammer or anything like that, then I'm pretty much assured that I don't have a hard pan or I haven't created that situation just yet. So we're gonna take this piece of rebar here, and like I said, the the upper four inches are a little, are a little concerned, but as I press down in here, if my weight can send that rebar all the way down to that point there, you can easily see that we have not yet created a hard pan on this particular piece of ground. While we're continuing to standing, you know, standing here at the back of the tractor, 
I do want to point out the there's enough slope on this particular part of the ground. You can see here just my footsteps across uh, the tilled area. It really has lifted and, and prepped a nice seed bed that with the tailgate down on the tractor or the tailgate down on the tiller, it allowed um, a nice pressing of the soil and created what is really a, almost a finished product to plant or actually um, either transplant or seed right into. So from that standpoint, uh, the other things we would like to look for after a tilling uh, operation or after the tiller has been run through is once again, I don't want a soil, I don't want to have created a soil that will create a muddy ribbon or any type of ribbon out across my fingers. And as you can see, this soil is just wonderfully pliable and breaks apart in my hand with no, no effort whatsoever. So once again, we've timed this at just about three days uh, to really provide us the most, uh, I guess, productive use of the tiller or uh, this particular type of equipment in a bare ground situation and setting us up for planting. All right, viewers, I've walked us around up here actually to the front of the tractor because I wanted to demonstrate for um, everyone watching uh, what compaction or how compaction uh, can be created. In this particular situation, we've already described nearly a perfect ground preparation with regards to soil, uh, soil moisture level and friable soil that breaks apart in our hand. And uh, by moving up here to the front, we'd back the tractor up a short distance. I wanted to display here at the front of the machine this is why, and in future segments, we may explain this really in the no-till segment, but this is why we'd really like to plant and or grow whatever crops we're interested in, in actual grow zones. And when I say that, that's the distance between the two tractor tires or the whatever equipment usage that we're actually running that is not experiencing the compaction that you see right here. What we're doing simply by having moved this tractor back just a few feet, it's very visible as to how the center, the tilled area that we've progressed up through the field in, has still got that nice, loose, pliable material, and it will certainly settle in a few days time uh, as well. But we haven't created uh, nearly the hard uh, imprint from the weight of the tractor here at the wheel points. And depending on how you choose to grow, what crop you're choosing to grow, um, th that's of little concern in large field operations where um, our, our equipment and our planting equipment behind the tractor uh, certainly achieves the necessary depth of seed planting and disturbance of soil and the repack uh, of soil around the seed so that it's of little concern. I'd like to mention to our viewers as well, anytime we're out in a, in a larger planting situation, uh, like what we have around us here, the, uh, it becomes a real difficulty with some of our slopes that we're working on to create a nice, smooth, or uniform seed bed. And when it comes to those crops that we typically grow in a larger field situation, Many of those are either free seeded or, and or seeded directly into the soil and or sometimes we'll use a transplant machine. But the importance of establishing a uniform soil layer or soil, a prepped soil is no less important regardless of whether we're seeding directly into the material or whether we're transplanting into the material. And what I'd like to point out is the few extra steps that we took earlier to uh, once again level the tillage equipment so that when it's traveling uh, behind the tractor and not undulating back and forth and it's actually being held in line with the parent piece of equipment. As it's traveling forward or back, it's really almost like a motor grader from the standpoint it's creating a, a very level um, seed bed in which to plant into. 
So then if we're following, say with a corn crop, uh, the situation where uh, as far as many of our plants go, uh, or certainly our seeds go, corn is one of the most deeply planted seeds that we'll be putting in the home garden. And at two inches of depth, it's really important that this machinery has created a uniform uh, soil bed for that seed in which to germinate and then to rise up through and poke the top of its head out of the ground. So the uniformity of germination is largely created by the soil preparation that goes in firsthand. So if we can plant all that seed at the, ex at the accepted depth, and the equivalent soil moisture across that field at that depth and provide the similar conditions of you know, reduced compaction or whatever it may be, all those are coming together to generate a crop that is gonna come up on time and not leave spots here or there that are gonna create potential problems for us later on. Oftentimes bare openings or bare spots where seed doesn't germinate or say we have seed that germinates irregularly behind the rest of the crop will lead to those weak areas within the field that never really catch up to our other areas in the field, which results in disease or other uh, insects uh, or other pest pressures to really kind of move in on a crop that may then spread to our desirable production. So, once again, if I could stress anything with regards to the equipment and the soil preparation, a properly prepared seed bed that has been firmed back, uh, has provided um, plenty of depth to allow for a, a uniform seeding with whatever type of seeder we choose to use, or a transplanter when it comes to actually transplanting in, all those are steps that are critical to achieving a uniform crop that will be greatly reduced in later uh, pest pressures uh, due to the irregularity that we would see from poor planting. I'd like to mention to our growers uh, the situation that this particular field is, is in. Uh, with this initial preparation of a week or two ago, uh, we incorporated the uh, parent material. Uh, this could have been a green cover crop or other type of organic material to work in to help build our soil. But in every case, it's a situation that uh, is necessary um, to help warm the soil, particularly this time of year. Like I mentioned, we are about three weeks out. We can choose to leave a, a top surface or a, a surface of last year's cover crop or material there, but that oftentimes tends to maintain a cooler soil. So in the event that I know which crop I need to, to get in the ground, I might be looking at planting, um, say for say a, a warm season crop, for instance, the uh, earlier that I work at getting some of this incorporated back in and the ground turned up, the faster I will warm this soil behind me as opposed to uh, leaving that crop residue behind for a, la a later um, operation in the season. It's important for soil, all soil, not to be uniform in size, but to have those various components and peds and the, the individual uh, sized material that allows our water to percolate and make its way down. It provides air space for the plant root systems uh, it's just as important for plant roots to have uh, good air transfer as just about anything else. So whether you're planting potatoes or whether you're planting corn, uh, don't get overly concerned with small rock material, uh, particularly if you have the ability to, uh, during the process of tilling things back in, just plant the rock back.
Well, neighbors and friends, we've made it up here on top of the hill uh, to check out a, a new, newly filled raised bed. Uh, certainly a wonderful option for those of us that are trying to remove our vegetable gardening from our furry friends that may, do, may be down at the larger garden and uh, put some of our prized vegetable production, whatever it may be, or our flower uh, flowers as it may. We may actually uh, get them up here where we have a little, bit, little better ability to monitor uh, for the wildlife that will come calling and visiting us eventually. Now that being said, this is just a, a typical raised bed that you'd find online uh, anymore. The, uh, I oftentimes get the question of, you know, what do I fill a raised bed with and what, do I, what type of my material do I need to, to add in a given situation? And the, uh, the important thing to think about is where do I start? And that largely uh, comes down to the fact that these raised beds uh, have a set amount of soil material inside or that we can add to them. But if we've cleared the, uh, cleared the turf or the sod from below the bed and have actually worked the soil uh, where the, the raised walls have been set down, our plant material can continue uh, to grow right down and into the parent soil down below. So when it comes to actually setting up a, a small raised system like this, I would encourage anyone to first think about cutting out the sod uh, from where your actual raised bed is located. And most of your sod roots or your grass roots are only about two inches deep. So you can actually see from the, the pile right to the, the left of the camera right there that it's not difficult to really work you out a section of sod, stir up your parent soil that's there below, and then we start thinking about what we're gonna add as far as amended soil or growth, grow, uh, growing material uh, to the raised bed itself. And for those of us in a country situation, that can be composted manure, it can be actual compost uh, from the household use, it can be actual uh, soil from a, a nice rich wood lot. It can be uh, old composted or broken down mulch. Uh, I often find that uh, the area around the house when new mulch is being applied in the spring around Mother's Day and all the flowers and stuff are going in, they oftentimes to need to remove some old mulch. It's an excellent material to stir in with your parent material and really create a nice uh, growing medium for whatever we're planning to, to plant inside. Now, that being said, all plants need a given root space in which to develop in, or a certain amount of soil for those roots to expand out and into. If I was planting tomatoes in this, in this small, um, I guess this is roughly a four, four by six size bed, keeping in mind that your average tomato plant needs three to four cubic feet of soil is very easily um, drawn out. You can see that I'd fit just a few tomato plants over here on this one side before I'd start running out of room. Um, but that's if I'm going for the overall uh, growing process. Some of us may be using these smaller raised beds to actually start some of our vegetables in or start um, as a starting or a germinating bed, a germinating bed to uh, initially get our starts um, uh, growing. And after a few weeks, we'll be able to uh, transplant them to another larger location. So raised beds are wonderful uh, in that they certainly allow us to be better, to better monitors of where we're growing and what we're growing. And uh, they, they offer us lots of different ideas with regards to how we can use them. My suggestion for raised beds is to involve the kids, whether it be the grandkids, the, the larger kids. We've got too many kids inside the house playing those video games right now. And this is a wonderful way to spark their interest here in the spring of the year uh, about where food comes from and what vegetables we might be planting in the garden. 
I know I've got a, a nephew of my own that uh, has taken a real interest in his gardening efforts, so it's almost a competition between himself and his extension agent. Meanwhile, for those of us that may want to get kids involved or kids uh, interested in, in gardening in general, there's ways to involve even the youngest kids. And one of the means or ways to do that is to involve them in the actual planting process. So that when we do have germination occur and those young plants are coming up, they can see firsthand that they contributed to the growing of those plants. And I have here one of the kind of an interesting way to measure things out, the, uh, particularly if you have some kids involved. It's not every day that we involve kids or can explain to particularly the smaller kids, uh, even the toddlers in some cases, how deep se uh, seeds need to be planted. And we all do know from experience, seed, in order to germinate well and to perform well, do have a, an ideal depth in which they should be planted. And I was just demonstrating here, you know, seeds are grown at, at multiple depths. If we were thinking about planting this entire raised bed right here in corn, um, I'd be working literally, uh, I would be working my corn seeder right on down into the soil to a depth of two inches. And right up here is my blue line, but if I involved the kids and worked my corn seeder back and forth, I can achieve a nice two inch deep furrow in which they can then plant their seeds right down the furrow and cover things back over. And I've got that entire line of corn down through there, nine inches apart. Uh, planted and ready for them uh, to germinate at that two inch level. Now, the corn is certainly something we probably won't see in such a small container. So when we think of the other things that we might find in a raised bed, uh, maybe it's a, 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 maybe it's beans, bush beans, or maybe it's squash or other melons or um, cucurbits in general. Maybe it's some spring peas or some sugar snap peas that the kids could enjoy uh, and would certainly uh, do well in the early cool months leading into uh, the warmer summer months. So in terms of those seeds, those are seeds that the general majority of uh, garden plants tend to grow well when planted at, at a certain depth. And that is usually that half inch to three quarter inch depth. So what I've got here is my um, three quarter inch uh, dowel rod, and I can pass that off to the, the niece, the nephew, or the, the kids it may be, and they can work the dowel rod right in there to the point where it starts to, starts to disappear. They can raise the dowel rod right up, and now they've got a comfortable you know, half inch to three quarter inch depth that they can plant their other seeds in. Works twofold. Not only is it the correct depth, but they have a nice straight line in which to estimate the, the spacing of their seeds through the rest of the bed. Lastly, there's always those seeds that require, require much less seed depth, particularly uh, when it comes to germinating. And uh, we think that some of those may just need to be on top of the ground and, and the things that were be planted that tend to lie and drop to the ground as far as their seed is concerned, they like to grow from that depth. But when you start thinking about lettuce and carrots and even, um, even marigolds to some degree, some of their seed gets very, very small, we use a quarter inch depth rod. And once again, just a, a dollar or two at your favorite hardware store, you can have that child work the rod right back and forth to it's just about out of, out of sight there in the soil. Firm back and forth across there. Now as the rod comes up, they have a nice quarter inch seed depth all the way across there in which to plant their seed that likes that, that more shallow uh, depth. And once again, a light hand right across the top and now we've planted this raised bed in both the seed that requires the additional depth as well as some of that uh, lesser seed. I will point out, I just wanted to give you some ideas for viewers. 
when it comes to those seeds that really do like the quarter inch depth, um, all your lettuce, lots of your lettuce varieties for your spring, your spring mixes and stuff, easily grown by children, um, uh, really do their speed at which they germinate and stuff is very nice as well. We have radish. Um, uh, my grandfather, my papa's means of planting radish was never to walk out of the corn without broadcasting a little uh, radish seed between the corn plants. So once again, a seed requiring a relatively small uh, planting depth. Carrot is interesting in that we would think with the, how small carrot seed is, that it would actually be one of those that would be preferred to be planted on top. That simply is not the case. If you do not co cover carrots, your seeding percentage will drop by over half. So in the terms of, uh, once again, a quarter inch seed line or seed, seed base, carrots will do very well in that shallow line. Um, then we can move into even our peppers and tomatoes, both Solanaceae, both the same family of plants, both very similar with regards to their seed, but will do well in that quarter inch spacing. So right there are some very common plants that can be enjoyed by not only us as adults when they're coming in and maturing for our, uh, our interest out of the garden, our raised planting efforts, but something with the colors and the, and the difference and availability and stuff of the different varieties that are simply available now. I can get purple carrots. I can get uh, all different colors of carrots and things that would really draw a child's interest back outdoors and into a growing situation. When it comes to planting some of these other varieties, these are actually wonderful uh, opportunities to show children firsthand what can be achieved in, in raised soil systems. The, um, the tendency for watermelon to really do good, or for that matter, cantaloupe or most any melon, does really, really well in a raised bed system. Uh, particularly if you get some of the bush varieties and stuff now, um, they'll certainly fill up this space rather quickly, but it's cool to watch the watermelon that's planted up here cascade over into the yard and travel out and around the edge of the bed, for that matter. Um, the ability of the tried and trues, um, certainly when it comes to squash and certainly zucchini or the, um, particularly in those um, bush zucchini and things, uh, they will absolutely love being planted by seed. And that's the case of the melons as well. Um, any of these larger seeds that really do like that three quarter inch depth to an inch in depth, they, uh, they really do perform best when seeded straight out into the garden location. Long, long story short, I just encourage all of you, um, We've got to get our children back outdoors and we've got to find some enjoyable ways to involve them, maybe at a small scale, before we can move them out to the larger scale of weeding in the garden. And I would just encourage everyone there to uh, maybe involve a child this season in planting out uh, some of the varieties of their choice. Invite them to that aisle of their favorite uh, store here in Floyd. I don't care whether you, you shop Ingram's or Harmons or uh, Wills Ridge, you know, support our local suppliers and um, encourage a child to pick out something that they'd like to grow and involve them in the process. Until then, or until later, we'll, uh, we'll talk again and enjoy something in our next segment.